All right, we are almost there. We have one last company to see. Um, that company is Oxy Health. Presenting for Oxy Health are CEO Hugh Lloyd Jukes and research lead Dr. Oliver Gibson. Good afternoon. I'm Hugh, Chief Executive of Oxy Health. Imagine for me, please, that you're the head nurse on a step down ward post operative and it's midnight. This is what you see 12 closed doors. Now, the patients behind those doors are in one of four states. They're in bed, they're resting, don't wake them up. They're in bed, they're deteriorating unexpectedly, they need attention. They're out of bed, they've got into trouble, they need help. And tragically, they could be in either position and already dead. And that does happen. So as head nurse today, what you do is you go on your rounds. Every four hours, you physically take a trolley down the corridor, you enter the room, and you attach wired monitoring devices to those patients. You wake them up, and you take their vital signs. Now, that's flawed because you wake them all up, irrespective of condition, and because four hours is a long time, and a lot can happen in that space. So how could we apply technology to help that head nurse? Well, quite far-looking doctors are starting to put cameras into their wards. So you get a feed like this. Can you tell how that patient's doing? Can you see whether they're safe or deteriorating? Of course you can't. Cameras are great if you're watching them for context and gross information, but they won't ever, on their own, proactively alert you to deterioration. That is where we come in. We transform video cameras, we turn them into health monitors. We take a normal video camera, we add our software, which has proprietary algorithms analyzing the signals on every pixel on that sensor. That can sit either on the camera itself or on a low-cost device attached to it. We hook that up to our cloud, that monitors performance, and it pushes updates. And together, that solution delivers to the nursing station real-time alerts, vital signs, and if the nurse chooses, video on demand. So we're going to show you that live. Oliver's going to take us to Oxford now, and I'll show you it working. So top left, there's your patient through a two megapixel digital camera. Bottom left, that's his breathing rate, medical grade, real time, 16. And at 106 beats a minute, that's his heart rate, right now, 100 miles away in Oxford. So we can give you deterioration with medical accuracy through a camera. And what that does is it gives you medical insight. The insight here is quite straightforward. I know Nick, his resting heart rate is 60 beats a minute. He's currently running 109. Yesterday it was 112. And that means that even in Oxford, presenting to you a lot is pretty stressful. Um, if you look above the heart rate where it says patient in bed, let's see something else. So we're getting Nick out of bed now. And we're waiting for him to respond down the Skype. There he goes. So just watch. There it says movement lose the vitals, and shortly it'll tell you he's out of bed. So we're giving you vital signs, and we're giving you activity monitoring. Could we go back, Oh. So head nurse, today you're going to see this corridor. Tomorrow you're going to see these 12 rooms with vital signs and activity status. You're going to see visual alerts and hear audible alerts. If Oliver, can you click in on room four for me? So you can click in, you can see, advantage of video, the context of what's going on in that room and you can log your action and what you've decided to do with that information. So this is medical grade vital signs. This is Professor Lionel Tarasenko, our founder, the head of engineering at Oxford. He ran two foundational clinical studies that showed that our algorithms are as accurate as a contact medical device, something you put on the body. We took that technology and some of the research group, including Dr. Gibson here, out of the university, built a company around them, and went into the field. In the field, we've also, for example, this is Broadmoor Psychiatric Hospital, high secure mental health. We found that, again, we're as accurate as a contact medical device on both respiration and heart rate. So this is a complex product. We're going to market in two phases. The first is video analytics. That's the in and out of bed activity of a human being in a room. The second is medical analytics. That's the vital signs. And of course, that's going to be a medical device. The truth here, though, is that the scarce resource in our healthcare systems are doctors and nurses and their time. We have to put that time onto the most urgent situations with the best data. We also badly need to step people down from expensive locations like hospitals to cheaper locations like nursing, care homes, and our own homes. 
And we believe that video cameras empowered by OxyCam software are the ideal platform. Activity, vital signs, and context all in one place. So we passionately want to help doctors save lives and improve healthcare for everyone by delivering these systems into every care setting globally. I'm really proud of the team, and I'm very proud of our momentum. In video analytics, we're inking our first two commercial deals. They're at contract negotiation stage. And our pipeline's very strong. We have 15 police forces, eight mental health trusts. In medical analytics, we have those first clinical studies I mentioned, and we're adding a third, which is a long-run study. But we're also, again, at contract stage on two development partnerships. So that's NHS Trust, where we're looking at doing a series of very focused clinical studies, which are aimed at productizing what bundle of algorithms the doctors want out of our IP. So in summary then, at OxyHealth, we transform video cameras. We turn them into health monitors. That places a transformative tool in the hands of carers and doctors. If that excites you, I don't know if you're a clinician, a carer, an investor, a journalist, or a healthcare company, do get in touch. We're in the alley for the rest of the day. Uh, and uh, of course, we're at oxyhealth.com. Thank you for your time. Well done, mate. Judges. Great. Why, sorry. Oh. <laughs> Why is it better to use this versus just giving people a bracelet? It seems probably more accurate, simpler. It's actually neither of those things. So um, when you're stepping someone down, only about 5 to 15% of wards have any contact devices on them. So I'm talking acute hospitals now. That's because you want them to feel as mobilized and as free as possible. So you don't want to put anything on the, on the body. If you look at our accuracy, they are, it exceeds most wearables, and it leaves people totally free and totally unobtrusive. The other thing you've got to worry about is white coat syndrome. The sheer actually in a vital sign influences the vital sign, so you get in, uh, unuseful medical data. And of course, we're effectively in the air. So there's a lot of different technologies for measuring heartbeat and, mm. and uh, respiration, yeah. even remotely, even without a contact mm. device. It seems video cameras could be troublesome, just, you know, person moves to their side, they, they have two layers of, of, uh, of uh, you know, bed sheets blankets or blankets yeah. over. I mean, how often does it really, uh, you know, you know you're, you're showing us this magic, which is quite magical, actually, yeah. and, and wonderful, uh, but, you know, how often does it uh, muck up? Yeah, so... You're right, the, when we show people live demos in Oxford, magic is the adjective that they attach. Um, th there are two pieces to that. How does it work and how reliable is it? Yeah. So it, there are two things you've seen. So you took breathing rate first and you said, well, what if they're under blankets and so forth? Does it still work? Mm -hmm. Breathing rate is highly robust. In fact, you can cover yourself with a blanket and be totally obscured. That can be a thick ja uh, jacket, that can be a, a duvet. You can go under a desk and only have half your body and we'll still get your breathing rate because the chest influences the movement of the body so significantly that we can see that with the camera through signal processing. Mm -hmm. Now on heart rate, of course, if you cover the skin, we, uh, we can't get your heart rate. The reason for that is we use the same technology as a contact pulse oximeter. So every time your heart beats, you perfuse and you go red, not red, red, not red. The contact device shines a light and notes that. We do exactly that, but at several meters of distance. So if your skin's obscured, we can't get you. Now in terms of when can we get it, a brief movement doesn't disrupt it so that it affects the vital signs. And if you're, for example, the core use is overnight while you're sleeping, and we'll get you, I would say, high 90s in the kind of scenario you've seen. So it's really very robust to small movements, and it gives you an extended vital sign monitoring. Francesca. Yeah, um, fascinating pitch. Uh, one of the things that interests me is about how your technology can learn and improve over time with usage effectively. Yes. Are there feedback loops that you can feed in to the technology to make it better and better as time goes on? Yeah, there are. So the, the base here is signal processing and computer vision, but we're also significant machine learning. And yes, clearly as we add more instances to the, the data, we can uh, improve the algorithms in a number of very specific but confidential ways. Can you talk a little bit more about how you measure your accuracy levels and how um, and what your accuracy levels really are. Because you know, with more, most startups, if it's late or if it doesn't work, you get your food 10 minutes later, yeah. you're annoyed, you have to wait outside for your Uber, but you'll be fine. Here, the impact is potentially terrible, right? If, if you don't get to the patient in time or... So yeah, so, so can I take, the, I think there are actually two questions in that, so sure. taking them in turn. Yeah. One is, 
uh, how accurate are we and how do we know? And the other yeah. is what's the ramification to the alert? So on the accuracy point, we, well, it's very straightforward to measure. We take a, a reference clinical device, either a finger pulse oximeter um, or a, a chest breathing band, uh, which are the two reference uh, devices, and we directly compare our outputs. So taking heart rate, uh, if you take a pulse oximeter on each finger or perhaps on the ear, they will be plus or minus uh, the heart rate by three beats, so 77 to 83. Hmm. We're in exactly the same band. Uh, on the breathing, it, there isn't actually a medical standard on that because uh, although you can get these chest bands, which is the most accurate mathematical way to do it, the standard is actually a, chair, a, a nurse looking at your chest and counting over 15 seconds. So four breaths times by four, 16 breaths a minute. Um, in that scenario, we use the chest band and we've held ourselves, we've invented the standard, a higher standard of plus or minus two breaths a minute. So, yeah, sorry, go sorry. Ahead. Um, are you looking at replacing completely these medical devices? Um, are you looking at replacing those medical devices and be the only one that doctors and nurses will use? No, I think we, our primary markets are places where you can't use those devices. Okay. So those are what we term secure rooms and then general healthcare. So secure rooms, police, secure mental health, where you can't introduce a contact device because there's a self-harm risk. So there you don't get any vital signs or activity monitoring at the yeah. moment. Also, those situations tend to have CCTV already. That's why the camera is such a good platform. In the other piece is in acute or general healthcare. Um, this is, again, you don't have these wired devices beyond intensive care and high dependency, which, as I say, is 5 to 15% on, depending on geography. So you have a whole unmonitored space, which takes me back to the lady with the black hairs question. Sorry, which is the second part of that, which was... Um, the ramifications. The ramifications. Yeah, liability. Yeah. Yes. So the liability, which is in both <laughs> these instances, be you a, a police officer or a, a, a health professional, you have legally or clinically mandated checking regimes. So you risk assess and you check on a cadence, the four hours, the two hours, maybe in police every 15 minutes. What we're providing is the safety net, a support technology to those professionals that be between their mandated checks, ah, okay, they get sure. a supplement they can't get at the moment, totally unobtrusively. Okay. It doesn't replace them doesn't going replace. to see the patient. They just okay, got We're it. We're trying yeah. to support so care. Still, so you still yeah. wake up the patient every four hours in order to get their. I, I think at the point of introduction, you would need to do that. But yeah. over time, I think that the clinical practice will change and will empower people. What? So, uh, you, what's your uh, success rate so far? Have you deployed this in? So we've deployed into uh, clinical studies and into development partnerships in uh, acute hospitals. So kidney, renal and neonatal premature babies. Those, by the way, we chose those on the accuracy point because their vital signs vary dramatically through that. They go highly tachy and bradycardic, which mm -hmm. is high and low heart rate. So we worked there in the, the university hospital. We've then gone into police and into mental health, including high security at, at Broadmoor for field studies. And as I say, we're right now, uh, the lawyers have just sent me the draft on a couple of contracts for our first commercial deployments. Okay, and so what would you anticipate your what have your revenues been to date, and what, what do you think they, they'll be in the next one, three, five years? So the revenues to date have been uh, early development revenues, so in the tens and hundreds of thousands. Uh, the, the revenue uptick, uh, it's a two-phase model here. So this is a SaaS model ultimately, our software on uh, partners, hardware, and solution deployment. And so that's going to be a high margin, high growth business. Uh, the um, in the near term, we're going to spend the early part. You have to get the economics of each use case very clear. So we're delivering projects where we own the hardware, the software, and the solution delivery so we can understand the bargaining power. So in the near term, that's a lower, slower revenue growth. But then as you pass it over to the partners, it effectively becomes digital distribution through the cloud. So over the next year, where, where would you anticipate your revenues being? It would be a little bit easy to backtrack out our... Um, our business and our economics out of that number because of the, we strike a small number of deals. So I'd rather, can I talk to the value we price on and the size of the opportunity sure, how much, and then how you much can you charge yeah. per, per bed or whatever. Yeah. So take mental health, we price to value. So in mental health, uh, you stay in acute mental health for on average 35 days. We believe we can cut that by 10 days by reducing uh, the interference with the patient. And that's actually numbers that have come from clinicians who've approached us to do a randomized controlled trial. At an average cost per patient of 100,000 to 350,000 pounds of care a year, you're looking at up to 100,000 of saving per room. So we'll price against that. So again, while I don't have a list price, it's in the thousands per year 
per room rather than the hundreds. So then you have to go look at the number of rooms that are out there that are addressable. Developed economies, it's 25 to 35, 30 million. So U US, UK, it's about 13 and a half million rooms. So you can start to see a very sizable opportunity and something that's addressable very easily through the partner base. I, I see that, you know, there's a big market for this, uh, yeah. for remote monitoring. But there's, there's a lot of potential other hardware solutions that that's don't true. require the video monitoring. So I think your price point may be difficult to sustain at that, at, th at that relatively, what sounds to me, usury price point. Uh, you know, it's a, a, a what price point? Uh, it's a uh, egregious, uh, egregiously egregious. high uh, you know, <laughs> uh, price point. But uh, but so so uh, so it's interesting to hear you say that. I, I think it may not be sustained at that level, and you still may have a very good business and a very useful business. Mm -hmm. I can see this expanding to elderly care facilities, yeah. uh, it's, et cetera. So that's right. Um, but so, so are you telling me that I've got a great business because? even if the price is lower than we're currently closing at, that it'll be a good revenue base? I, I think you, I would I think agree you with could that. have a very good, <laughs> I think you ha could have a very good business. Uh, and, uh, but but uh, I think you'll have a lot of competition for the means. So can I take the competition point? Because yeah. I think that's interesting and substantial. So healthcare is a huge business, right? So lots of uh, companies are attacking it. There's a lot of hardware and, and software going after that space. I think the thing that sets video apart for the early use cases, but as you say, a whole range of use cases, including a B2C model we haven't talked about that could come out of this as a platform, is video has certain advantages. So I've shown you the activity monitoring, I've shown you the vi vital signs. We've talked already about the fact white coat syndrome doesn't apply because you don't influence the subject. But also, you can, because of context, you'll get novel health indicators out of video. And of course, if you want to, you can then stream and see what's going on. Now you start moving into community, that is a unique advantage. So that and the toleration sets it apart against other substitute technologies, you might argue. To me, it feels like it's more useful in cases that aren't in hospitals where you haven't already got those m vital signs being monitored. So for example, prisons or police cells. Or the home. Or the home. Um, how do you see that? Why have you approached the, the hospitals as a first port of call as opposed to that market? So I, th I think there's two things here. So the first port of call in particular focus is mental health and, and police, to your point. I think that the great thing about this technology is that the advocates are the clinicians. And so conferences, uh, we have a wonderful ripple effect thanks to our partners who go and talk about us. And of course, uh, the, the easiest way to influence someone is, is through their, their favorite settings. So if you're, you, the hospital pushes forward the research and gives us the clinical studies for those other settings. These are, after all, just people in rooms from the camera's point of view. And it builds our clinician advocate base, which um, moves us into new use cases. What are the next things on the roadmap beyond just the things you're monitoring at the moment? And answer as quickly as you can. A bunch of that's confidential. We have patents around blood oxygen, like the pulse oximeter, and also about blood pressure using pulse transit time as a proxy. So that gives you a hint that there's a whole ton of hard vital signs in there. Uh, before we even talk about video analytics. All right, give it up for OxyHealth. Thank you. Thank you.